In this 11th lecture, we talk about research ethics, a very important part of carrying out research. Research involves certain power play. You see, the researcher seems to be better educated than the researched subjects or participants. And in a, let us say if you're conducting an interview, surely the interviewer seems to have an ascendancy, a dominance over the interviewee. And therefore, the interviewee or the participant becomes a vulnerable person. And we need a set of guidelines to protect the rights of that participant who is vulnerable in this situation. And therefore, we have research ethics guidelines to carry out researches. Basically, we will talk about seven of these principles. When you're writing your method chapter, it is very appropriate in your last section of your method chapter, you discuss research ethics. How are you going to handle the ethical issues that can arise out of your relationship with the participants? And that is, uh, that is what we talk about in research ethics. The more sensitive the topic is, more diverse the differences are between the researcher and the researched subjects or participants, more careful we need to be while handling ethical issues. The first principle in research ethics is informed consent. What does it consist in? that the participants say yes to your data collection process after being informed of what this data collection entails. So we call a cover story. You need to have a cover story to tell them, which should be written down so that it does not bias or prejudice your findings. Because if you say different things to different participants as your explanation for your research, it can sort of influence the data. And therefore, usually departments expect that you include a written explanation of your research and what it entails in trying to collect the data. And usually they are approved by an ethics research committee in, from the department. So, but in telling them what is your research about, you don't need to give the hypothesis away. You just have to explain your research in general terms sufficient for them to make a decision and in such a way that informed consent can be assured. So that is the first ethical principle, informed consent. The second ethical principle is the freedom to withdraw. That no participant should be compelled to participate in a research. Now, this is more tricky, especially in a situation like a classroom where a lecturer is collecting data. That will the lecturer, if the lecturer is the, is the researcher, will they give that freedom to withdraw from the data collection process for every student? Or it could be that you are the researcher and the lecturer has allowed you to collect data. Now, in a classroom situation, students may be pressurized to answer your questions because it is a classroom. But we need to ensure the freedom to withdraw. Now, there is a tricky part to this principle that they, this freedom is, in a, in a sense, very absolute, that they can withdraw their data at any time of the research. And this is an interesting fact to handle. Therefore, right at the beginning, it is important to be transparent, to make sure of the informed consent so that nobody really rethinks their decision later, in a sense, to withdraw the data from your data set. And that's going to be tricky for you. So make sure of your informed consent, ensuring the freedom to withdraw right at the beginning, and therefore you're not having any eventualities. The third ethical principle is no deception. You can't say, particularly in, say, when there are body tissues involved, you can't take blood of a participant uh, saying that you are measuring for TB, but actually you're testing for HIV. That is deception. 
uh, if you're uh, in psychology, there have been famous studies. You might want to Google and find out about Milgram's experiments of participants being told that they are being studied on a certain behavior, but actually they were being studied on another behavior that the participants were not aware of. And this would be unethical. No deception. Don't tell lies. You don't need to tell the whole truth about your research. But you don't need to deceive your participants. The fourth principle is that the researcher and the participant should be protected from known physical and psychological harm, like stress. If your questions are going to cause stress to your participants, you have to see how you're going to mitigate this stress. You, you might not want to do this research, particularly if you're not in a situation to handle the amount of stress or distress that could come out of these, your questions. On another hand, other hand, you could have a counselor to stand by to deal with these situations that come out of your research. So avoid physical and psychological harm to yourself and to your researcher, to your participant out of this research. The fifth principle, confidentiality and anonymity. Usually, we don't mention names in a research, but if you are doing a case study, you might have to talk about the individuals. And in which case, you are going to change the name of the participant. And you're going to precisely ask the permission of the participant that this is a case study. You are going to talk about one individual case or two individual persons. And you need explicit permission from them. Usually, what we do is we summarize the findings. We are not mentioning individuals. And this should be told to them. Uh, attached to that, Anonymity, because we don't mention name, is confidentiality. You are not allowed to use that data in another situation. And if you think that is going to prejudice the well-being of your participant, you might not want to even use that data, even in a research. You have to make very discreet judgments here to protect your participant. So confidentiality and anonymity. The sixth uh, principle is minimum influence on what is being observed. And what we mean here is being sensitive to cultural, gender, religious sensibilities. If you're, a, if you're a man doing a research on FGM, now there are sensible issues. You might not want to collect data on FGM as a man. You might want to get someone, a woman, who is talking to women about these very sensitive issues, particularly in traditional cultures when it comes to talking about sexuality. If you're a Catholic studying the Pentecostal church, how are you going to be sensitive to the very specific experience of the Pentecostals? Now, that means respect for sensibilities of people. And you don't want to make judgments on specific differences based on culture, ethnic difference, religious belief or gender. And that is the sixth principle, that you need to minimize the possibility of influence on the differences. And finally, academic integrity. Academic integrity. As a researcher, you are committed to human knowledge. It's not about marks. It is about building knowledge. So you don't want to hook up stories. You don't want to hook up data. You want to uh, really represent what you found and claim only what you found and make an argument for that. And these are the basic seven principles in research ethics.